better get into our study. Psalm 102. We're going to look at Psalms 102 and 103 as we continue going through the, uh, the Psalms together. So let's begin reading here in Psalm 102, and I'll just read the Psalm to you, and then we'll get into it. Psalm 102, beginning at verse 1. The psalmist writes, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my trouble. Incline your ear to me in the day that I call. Answer me speedily. For my days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burned like a hearth. My heart is stricken and withered like grass, so that I forget to eat my bread. Because of the sound of my groaning, my bones cling to my skin. I'm like a pelican in the wilderness. I'm like an owl of the desert. I lie awake and am like a sparrow alone on the housetop. My enemies reproach me all day long, and those who deride me swear an oath against me. For I have eaten ashes like bread and mingled my drink with weeping. Because of your indignation and your wrath, for you have lifted me up and cast me away. My days are like a shadow that lengthens, and I wither away like grass. But you, O Lord, shall endure forever, and remembrance of your name to all generations. You will arise and have mercy on Zion for the time to favor her. Yes, the set time has come. For your servants take pleasure in her stones and show favor to her dust. So the nations shall fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth your glory. For the Lord shall build up Zion. He shall appear in his glory. He shall regard the prayer of the destitute and shall not despise their prayer. This will be written for the generation to come that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. For he looked down from the height of his sanctuary. From heaven the Lord viewed the earth to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to loose those appointed to death, to declare the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. When the peoples are gathered together and the kingdoms to serve the Lord. He weakened my strength in the way. He shortened my days. I said, oh my God, do not take me away in the midst of my days. Your years are throughout all generations. Of old you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, all of them will grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will change them and they will be changed. But you are the same and your years will have no end. The children of your servants will continue and their descendants will be established before you. Once again, a very cheery psalm. What we're looking at is actually what has been referred to as a prayer of the afflicted. Uh, this obviously is an anonymous psalm and uh, its immediate context so that we might be able to get an idea of what's, uh, wh what is prompting this. The immediate context is that this has been written during a time of national exile. Now, as we look at this psalm, we note first that the psalmist is crying out that he's in desperate condition, and he's crying out that he needs God's help. He's being overwhelmed by the constant reproach of his enemies, and he needs deliverance. That's what he says in verse 8 when he says, My enemies reproach me all day long. Those who deride me swear an oath against me. And so he's asking the Lord to deliver him. In the midst of all of this, though, he's finding comfort in the fact that God is eternal, which means that his help is not temporary, and also in the fact that God will never forsake him. As a matter of fact, as he goes through this, in verse 17, it makes it very clear that God will answer his prayer. He says, he shall regard the prayer of the destitute and shall not despise their prayer. And so even though he's going through affliction, though he's going through a time of sorrow, Yet, at the same time, he's sure that God is listening and God will answer him. Now, not only is this psalm written in the context of a time of national exile, it also is a prophetic psalm because it foretells the agony of Jesus Christ. It can be used as a picture of the sufferings of Jesus, especially when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. You see, in verses 25 and 26, those verses are actually quoted in the New Testament book of Hebrews in chapter 1, verses 10 through 12 and they are specifically applied to Jesus Christ. And so what you see here is a psalm that one has a context, an immediate context. It's written by somebody in the midst of uh, an exile. And two, it has a prophetic reality because it's speaking concerning Jesus Christ and uh, is actually quoted in the New Testament. So as we begin looking at verses 1 and 2, uh, the psalmist says, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me. Obviously, the psalmist is in distress and he's crying out to the Lord that the Lord might hear his prayer. This is something that you read quite often in the psalms. The psalmist crying out saying, Lord, I'm praying to you, I'm crying out to you, and I'm asking you to please listen to me. Remember in Psalm 27, verse 9, 
how he had said there, the psalmist had said, Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You've been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. In Psalm 69, verse 17, the psalmist said, Do not hide your face from your servant, for I'm in trouble. Hear me speedily. So this is something that is a constant theme that you see over and over again in the Psalms. It's a, a cry out that the Lord will hear our prayer. And he's, even as I was reading this today and preparing the study, it, it gives me great courage or encouragement, if you will, to note that there are others who have gone through this long before I have where they have been in some kind of distress, anguish of heart or whatever, and they've cried out to the Lord and asked God if he would please move and move quickly. He says in verses 3 through 7 that his days are consumed like smoke and his bones are being burned like, like a hearth. Uh, he's given an interesting comparison uh, of what his life has been like. And as you look at this, he says that his, his days have been like smoke. He's like a hearth or burning embers. He's like withered grass. He's like birds. He's like a shadow. And all of this is intended to communicate one thing, how brief life really is. You see, in his affliction, he's inwardly exhausted and he's lost his appetite. He's even feeling abandoned. That's the picture you have when he says, I'm like a pelican in the wilderness or an owl in the desert or a bird that is sitting alone. He's so concerned that the, uh, this, this has really gripped his heart. Notice verse 7 when he says, I lie awake. I'm like a sparrow alone in the housetop. But I lie awake. I can't sleep. I feel abandoned. I'm dry within. I, I feel like my life is just withering up. And God, I need your help because at this moment right now, I'm even unable to sleep. This reminded me of Psalm 77, verse 4, where the psalmist there had said, You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. And so he's going through something that is intense and constant. It's something that has caused him to feel abandoned by the Lord and something that has caused him to feel dry spiritually within. It's something that has kept him awake at night. When he continues on in verses 8 and 9, he says, My enemies reproach me all day long. Those who deride me swear an oath against me. I have eaten ashes like bread, mingled my drink with weeping. Instead of having human sympathy for me, instead of having a compassionate heart as they see me going through the things that I go through, my enemies actually reproach me. They actually are mocking me. In verse 9, when he speaks of eating ashes, that's another way of speaking of a deep sorrow and a mourning. Going on, he says in verse 10, because of your indignation and your wrath, you have lifted me up and cast me away. My days are like a shadow that lengthens. I wither away like grass. Now, notice what he said, because of your indignation and your wrath. The context here would be simple. Israel as a nation has sinned against God, and God has chastened him because God stated to them that's what he'd do. The Bible tells us in Deuteronomy in chapter 4, verse 27, the Lord speaking, he says, The Lord will scatter you among the people. You will be uh, left few in number among the nations when the Lord will drive you. Leviticus 26, 33, God said, I will scatter you among the nations, draw out a sword after you. Your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. And so what is happening is the Lord is bringing chastening on the nation of Israel. That's the context. And so he, being part of the nation, is undergoing the same kinds of afflictions that, that those uh, in that nation that have rejected the Lord are enduring. And so he's saying this is something that is really, really causing me great pain. And through this experience, so he's learning some lessons. He's awakening to the fact that life is very short. His days are like a passing shadow, and he's like dried-up vegetation. Perhaps some of you um, heard the news recently that one of the young girls in our church, her name is Cassie, 16 years old, just turned 16 years old. Uh, Cassie went home to be with the Lord last week. Uh, her story had gripped the heart of a reporter from the Orange County Register. And they actually had done a couple of stories on Cassie, and it was in the newspaper just this last week. This is a beautiful young lady, used to be a cheerleader, contacted um, cancer, and uh, took her life. And what was so beautiful, if you will, about that whole story, and there is a beauty to it, is that when, when, when Cassie was about to go home to the Lord, 
you know, she had, she had planned out her, her funeral, even to the dress that she was going to wear. And, uh, I mean, she planned it out, and, and the reporter who was covering the story was very touched by her. And, and in the story, it reports how that she, when she was uh, breathing her last, uh, she actually smiled and raised her hands up. And then as she did so, then she went home to be with the Lord. It was a tremendous testimony to the, uh, to the reporter and to those who, uh, who are reading that particular newspaper account just this last week. Uh, in this fellowship right now, one of our staff members, uh, Ken, is a little girl who is eight years old who may very well be going home to be with the Lord tonight. Um, she's very, very ill, and she's had cancer and a tumor. And, and, you know, you read these things in the newspaper, but you experience these things in real life, don't you? I mean, this is, this is what life has for us. I mean, these are things that we all go through. These are things that we, that we have to come to understand. Life is very short, and we learn that. I mean, I, I am blessed and fortunate to have been given 54 years of life, but I don't have a guarantee that I've got 55 years. I don't have that guarantee. Nobody has a guarantee how long you're going to live. And, you know, as I think about that, that's one of the lessons that we have to really take into consideration. He has come to understand that his life is like a passing shadow. He's like dried vegetation. It is here today and it is gone tomorrow. In the Psalms, again, in Psalm 90, verse 10, the Bible says, the days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. You see, affliction often awakens us to the reality of how, how short our lives really are. And that's what the psalmist is speaking about here. In verse 12 and 13, he says, uh, You, O Lord, shall endure forever, and the remembrance of your name to all generations. You will arise and have mercy on Zion for the time to favor her. Yes, the set time has come. Now, in contrast to man's short life, God dwells in eternity. That's what he's speaking about in verse 12. It says, his, in essence, his name is enduring for all generations to be known and worshipped forever. In verse 13, he goes on to say, you will arise and have mercy on Zion for the time to favor her. Yes, the set time has come. And so this reveals something that is going to bring him from a time of sorrow to actually a time of joy. It reveals that he has faith in the promises of God. You see, the city is in ruins, and yet he still knows that God is going to restore it. When it speaks of Zion, Zion is another name for the city of Jerusalem. And so he knows that though the city may be lying in ruins, God's promise is that it will be restored, and therefore he has faith in the promises of God. In verse 14, he says, Your servants take pleasure in her stones and show favor to her dust. So the nations shall fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth your glory for the Lord shall build up Zion. He shall appear in his glory. He shall regard the prayer of the destitute and shall not despise their prayer. And so believers, in verse 14, not only love the city, they even love the stones and the dust of that city. And what this is really revealing to us is an intense concern for the city and for the glory of God. When he speaks in verses 15 to 17 and says, The nations shall fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth your glory, ultimately the rest restoration does not incur, occur until uh, Jesus returns. You see, the, the city of Jerusalem has been overthrown many times. It's not going to be uh, established permanently until the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so ultimately, all the prayers of those who have been praying for the peace of Jerusalem will one day be answered. We'll look at that a little bit more in a moment. He goes on in verse 18 and says, This will be written for the generation to come, that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. For he looked down from the height of his sanctuary, from heaven the Lord viewed the earth, to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to loose those appointed to death, to declare the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem, when the peoples are gathered together in the kingdoms to serve the Lord. So he knows that he's writing prophecy. He knows that he is writing concerning something that will really be experienced by a generation that has yet to come. And this particular generation that he's writing about is going to praise God because God keeps his word. Now, one of the things that's very important for us as Christians to understand tonight is that this book that we have in our hands, this Bible, is a supernatural book inspired by God's Holy Spirit as he moved writers to write the words that he gave to them. It's God's word. It's not the word of man. 
And because it is so, it is the one book in the, in the history of the world that contains pre-written history. It's called prophecy. And the Bible makes it very clear here in verse 18 that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. There's going to be a people, in other words, who have yet to exist. They hadn't existed during the time of the writing of this psalm. They will yet in the future exist who are going to praise God because God's Word is going to be demonstrated to be true. Even we today in the 21st century have opportunities to look back and to see what God has done and how He's fulfilled His Word. We know that in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, that Jesus Himself in his life and ministry fulfilled over 300 specific prophecies during his ministry while he was on earth. That you could look back into some of these Old Testament books, some of those books written a thousand years before Christ and even further, and you could see prophetic words speaking concerning Messiah who is to come. And when Jesus came, he fulfilled over 300 specific prophecies. So we now in the 21st century can look back to, you know, 21 centuries uh, before, and we can see Jesus Christ and know that he actually was fulfilling Scripture that was written a thousand years before him. And that gives to us now through hindsight a set of uh, a sense of, 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 of trust in the Lord. But if his word came true 2,000 years ago, we know that his word that has yet to still come true or still to come to pass, we know that it will happen because God's word is true. God speaks in the past of the future as if it's already occurred. Now, the Bible speaks to us concerning that in various places. For example, Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10, God speaking, and he says, Remember the former things of old. I am God, there is no other. I am God, there's none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, I will do all my pleasure. You know, God actually challenges the false gods in the Old Testament to declare the future because they can't. They don't control it. Only God inhabits eternity, you see. And he says, I'm God. That's who I am. Uh, Zechariah chapter 2, verses 10 through 12 says, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. Behold, I am coming, and I will dwell in your midst, saith the Lord. Many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and they shall become my people. I will dwell in your midst. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. The Lord will take possession of Judah as his inheritance in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. And so the Lord is going to inhabit um, uh, amongst the people. There's going to be a time when everything is restored, everything is brought back to the way it's supposed to be. Jesus Christ at that time is going to be ruling and reigning. And so this is what is a prophetic word here speaking concerning that. And a people yet to, cre to be created shall see this take place. Now, as we look at this, there's something else I wanted to point out to you. In verse 23, continuing, he weakened my strength in the way he shortened my days. They said, oh, my God, do not take me away in the midst of my days. Your years are throughout all generations. Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish. You will endure. Yes, all of them will grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will change them. They will be changed, but you are the same. Your years will have no end. The children of your servants will continue, and their descendants will be established before you. The bottom line is, this not only can speak concerning the way that the psalmist was feeling while he was writing. Notice verse 23, he weakened my strength in the way and shortened my days. But it also has a prophetic uh, application to the life of Jesus Christ, and it can express what was taking place in his uh, concluding uh, days of his ministry. For example, in Luke chapter 22, in verses 41 through 44, we have a picture there when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus was there crying out to his Father. And remember what it says there, Luke chapter 22, verses 41 through 44. Luke says, he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. He knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. An angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. His sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. He weakened my strength in the way he shortened my days. I said, oh, my God, do not take me away in the midst of your, my days. Your years are throughout all generations. Jesus is there in the garden agonizing, and he's asking the Lord God to hear his prayer. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 5, verse 7 says, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. He was heard because of his reverent submission. 
And though his father had heard his prayer, yet God's indignation and wrath fell on Jesus Christ because he bore our sins, and our righteous father cannot ignore them. Now, that's a very important point, and let me elaborate for just a moment about that. We today in the 21st century seem to have an idea that God doesn't think that sin is really that bad. I encounter believers every once in a while who have that kind of mentality that sin really isn't that bad. As a matter of fact, they cheapen it. They think it's really something that is just natural for them. I've had conversations with people who will say things to me like, well, yeah, I lose my temper, but that's just the way I am. You know, yeah, I drink once in a while, but you know what? I can't help it. It's just a weakness of my flesh. Yeah, every once in a while I go to bed with somebody I'm not married to, but you know, I'm a, a, a you know, human being. I have needs, and, and God is gracious, and God forgives, and, and you shouldn't condemn me for this. You ought to understand that's just the way it is with human beings, and, and don't be self-righteous, and don't be bringing judgment. And I hear that every once in a while. I've heard it often over the years. And what that is, it's a reduction of the holiness of God in order to make an excuse for us to continue in sin. It's saying that it's really not that big a deal, and we're failing to realize what Jesus Christ went through when he was in the agony in the garden, sweating drops of blood, and how he was on that cross and prior to that when he was being beaten, tortured, and then finally placed and nailed on a cross. And we fail to understand the depth that he went through. We fail to understand what he did for us. And when we have that mentality, when we think that it's no big deal, we, we have a tendency of cheapening God's grace and actually broadening it so that it basically just gives us an excuse to continue in sin. And there are numbers of people who think that way, failing to realize what Jesus Christ went through for us, failing to realize that he died for me not to give me permission to continue in sin and go to heaven, but he died on that cross for me to set me free from the bondage of sin and set me free to, to, to have the joy and the rejoicing of following him and, and the pleasure of having fellowship with him and the anticipation that one day will be fulfilled in relationship with him, not only here, but in heaven, going to heaven based on his righteousness and, and my humbling myself and saying, God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. And instead of reducing my sin to, to make it almost inconsequential or to excuse it as saying it's just the way that I am, what really happens when you start growing in the things of the Lord is you begin to hate the sin that Jesus died to set you free from. It ceases being that thing that is the object of your affection and desire. It ceases being the thing that you meditate on and, and want to fulfill constantly. Whereas at one time you might have been very quick to sleep with somebody simply because you wanted to have relationship with somebody in an intimate way. You get saved and you begin to realize that the deepest intimacy that you have is prayer and relationship with God through fellowshipping with Him in the Word and through prayer. You begin to realize that there are things that are much more important and greater and fulfilling than the things that you've been doing. And you realize that the new wine of the Holy Spirit is much more spiritually wonderful than the old wine that you used to drink. And you begin to realize those kinds of things and you change, you see. And what happens is we, we come to the understanding of what Jesus Christ has gone through for us. When we begin to understand that he was without sin and yet he died on that cross for us, when we begin to actually personalize that, to realize that, it changes your life. Marie and I, my wife and I, were talking just this last week about this. We were speaking concerning what Mary must have felt like, the mother of Jesus Christ. And Marie had asked me a question relating to her and all, and we were having a conversation about, about Mary. And I, and, I, and I began to share with her, you know, as a, as a, a dad to, to a mother and and. And we began to speak about that. I said, you know, how it was with, with our babies, you know. When our children were born, and when they hand that baby to you, and, and when you hold the baby in your arms, and, and you make promises to God and to that child, even as you're holding it, how that you're going to be the best parent you could possibly be, how you're going to protect them, and, and how you're going to care for them, and and you, you already have plans that you've been making, uh, hopefully that the Lord will fulfill through the life of this child. And your, your plans for them are good. You want them to be blessed and all. And, and I began to reminisce with Marie how, how, uh, how God gave to us our children. I can remember when, when uh, I took Corinne, my, my daughter, who's 27 now, how I took her to, to the doctor when she was uh, um, you know, a couple months old. And, and I was holding her in my arms. And, and I can remember how we had to take her for her shots. 
and, and Marie wasn't holding her, I was holding her, and, and her little head was resting on my shoulder, and the nurse comes walking over, and she says, we're going to have to give her a shot now. And I said, okay, and I can still remember holding her in my arms and, and the nurse pulling down her little diaper there, exposing her little, little bottom, and, and then, then plunging that, that, uh, that needle into her rear end, and, and she lifted her head off of my shoulder, and she stared at me right in my eyes like, man, what are you doing to me? You're supposed to be protecting me. And I cried. I'm crying. They're holding this little baby, and the nurse is looking at me. I don't think she'd ever seen something quite like that. As I'm just crying, I'm holding her like this in my arms, you know. I shouldn't tell you stories because I go back and emotionally and I refill it, you know, it, it comes back, you know. I should think of bad things she's done so I could be mad. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess what I'm trying to say is Mary felt that towards her son. She held him in her arms. She loved him. She held him and helped him to walk. He learned to walk. He said his first words to her and to Joseph. You know, undoubtedly, as a little boy, he'd run and fall and hurt himself, and mom would pick him up. I mean, that's the way it is. That's how it is with us. Jesus was human. You know, when he fell, he didn't just float six inches from the ground. I mean, he hit, you know. <laughs> that happened. You know, and there were times that she would see him, I'm sure, and hold him and comfort him. And then, this is what we were talking about, Marie and I, and, and the day comes when they, they hang him on a cross. And the sword that Simeon had said, in a, and a sword shall pierce your soul when he was dedicated in the temple at eight days. And Simeon the prophet had held him. This is for the rising and falling of many in Israel. And he looks at, at Mary and he says, and a sword shall pierce your own soul. She pondered on these things. She thought, this is an eight-day-old baby. What's going to happen? Thirty-three years later, she's standing at the foot of a cross, and she's looking up at her son, somebody who had never done wrong, somebody who was a joy every day of his life, the perfect child, the child who loved mama and, and loved his, 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 his stepfather, Joseph, the perfect child. And they took him, and they beat him, and he's bloody. His, his beard has been pulled out of his face. And she's standing at the cross, and looking. She's saying, this is my son. And a sword pierces her heart. See, if, if, you, if you love the Lord, you can't, you can't think of those things and then go out lightly and get drunk. You can't. If you love the Lord, you can't think of those things and, and go out and sleep with somebody just because you're lonely. If you love the Lord, your life changes because you know that he did that for you. And, and you don't want, if you will, you, you wouldn't want to add to the pain that he suffered by the continuation of a life that causes him grief even to this day, you see. We need to understand those things and once you begin to understand him, it, it's not guilt that, you know, some guilty weirdness inside of you that, that makes you try to be the best that you can. It's not that at all. It's, it, it's love. It's, it's, it's love for the Lord. It's, it's a desire just to, to do it for him because you're grateful to him. And, and that's what the Lord Jesus Christ went through for us. And and, and that's a picture how God's wrath and indignation had been laid on Jesus. And, and, and he said in verse 23 again, he weakened my strength in the way he shortened my days. And, and Jesus is praying, if there be any other way, but there was no other way. Well, continuing on, he says in verse 25, of old you laid the foundation of the earth. The heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, all of them will grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will change them. They will be changed. But you are the same. Your years will have no end. The children of your servants will continue. Their descendants will be established before you. 
So in contrast to, to man's short lifespan, God inhabits eternity. It's interesting how he says that the universe will even wear out like an old set of clothes, and even as it does, God remains unchanged. Because God is unchanging, his promises remain firm and trustworthy forever. So those who trust his word will continue into eternity in fellowship with him. Psalm 103. This is more upbeat. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children to such as keep his covenant and those who remember his commandments to do them. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength to do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, who, you ministers of his who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And so as we look at this particular psalm, it's a psalm of King David. It's a song of celebration. It's a song that celebrates God's greatness and God's glory. In the first five verses, he speaks concerning blessing the Lord. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. So he's calling on believers to, to bless the Lord and to remember all of his benefits. The word benefits there means his rewards. You know, you think that you've got a, a, you know, if you have a good union and all, and you get good benefits on the job, you know, but he's talking about benefits like this that your, your job can't offer you. He's speaking about forgiveness. He's speaking about healing. He's speaking about redemption. He's speaking how God crowns you with mercy and love, how he provides for you, how he strengthens you. He's saying that God does all of this, and therefore we ought to be praising him and thanking him. Notice in verse 3 when he speaks concerning the fact that God forgives all your iniquities and heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from destruction. He crowns you with loving kindness, tender mercy. He satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And so he's saying to us that, that believers bless the Lord and remember all his rewards because he's good to us. Now, notice with me, this is interesting, and I'll only touch on this for a moment, but in verse 3, notice how it says, he, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. It's interesting how that he actually combines, if you will, uh, iniquity and, and, uh, and, uh, and a disease, and forgiveness and healing. That's an interesting thing because the point he's making is very simple. There are some times that, um, well, one, in Scripture, very often sickness can be associated with iniquity. Not always, because you just can't make that comparison constantly. But you will see often that um, illnesses can be a result of, of, of sin. And, and we know that in this way. We know that today. I, I thought about it, for example. I wrote some things down, like if, if somebody will say is, 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 is shooting up, shooting up drugs. Well, I have friends who, who, you know, injected drugs who now have hepatitis C. And so you can, you can have a sin and a disease that's associated with that. Uh, you can have uh, illicit sex. You can be out there having intercourse with uh, different partners and all. You can end up with STDs or HIV AIDS. You can have that. Uh, there are people who are uh, indulging in alcoholism and, and they end up with cirrhosis of the liver. And you can, you can see that over and over again. And so sometimes the sinfulness of our life is going to have a very obvious result in it. And so 
as he's speaking concerning the fact that God forgives sin, he also reminds us that some sinfulness leads to, to certain conditions, but God can forgive and God can heal is the point. God can forgive and God can restore your life, and he does so through redemption. He crowns you, the Scripture says, with love and mercy, and he satisfies you with good things, and he renews you. In other words, you could have a life that is lived to the full. It can be vigorous, and it can be blessed by God. When he says in verse 5, your youth is renewed like the eagles, uh, Isaiah 40, verse 31 says, Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You can think of your old life and how depressed and how anxious you were about things. You can think about how you were weak constantly. Perhaps you were doing so many drugs that you weren't even sleeping very much. But now that you're saved, God is renewing you and invigorating you, and you're getting a strength that you didn't have before. God has a way of propelling you with His Spirit. Notice verse 6, how he says, The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. In other words, he doesn't tolerate injustice. His rule is righteous, and he delivers the righteous from oppression. Now, one of my favorite scriptures in the Psalms is verse 7 here. This is one of those most powerful scriptures. As a matter of fact, there's another one here that we'll look at in just a moment. But notice verse 7, how it says, He made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. Ways and acts. I've shared this with you before. Some of you will remember this as I, as I share this. Ways and acts. He showed his ways to Moses, but his acts to the children of Israel. What are you talking about? Well, we know that Moses had deep fellowship with the Lord. We know that God had an intimacy with him. He knew not only what God did, but based on his relationship with the Lord, he not only knew what he did, he also knew why he did it. He knew the Lord's ways, whereas Israel knew God's actions or his deeds. I've shared it this way with you. When you're dating somebody, you know, you call them up and you say, hello, this is, you know, so-and-so. I saw you at work, I got your number, and I don't know if you've ever noticed me before, you know, I work in the cubicle around the corner from you, and I was just, you know, just wondering, would you like to go out sometime? Sure, why not? Fine. I'll be there at 7. Oh, by the way, where do you live? So you go and pick them up, and I'll take you the male perspective, of course. Knock on the door. The young lady opens the door. Hi, how are you? It's nice to meet you up front, you know. And you're young enough to have to meet the parents while you're at it. So you walk in, hello, sir. And the, the man says to you, who are you? Well, my name is David, and I'm going to take your girl out tonight. And nice to meet you, sir, you know. And, well, yeah, bring her in on time, and I don't want you to come a minute late. Yes, sir. So you go to the car door, and you open the door up for her, and she sits down, and you close the door, and you get on your side. And by the way, where would you like to go? I was thinking that perhaps we could go out and eat and maybe go catch a movie or something. What would you like to do? Oh, I'd like to go to such and so place. Well, you know what? That's one of my favorite places. Let's go. And off you go. And you know what I'm saying. Opening the door and all of that, and then you get married. <laughs> you see, she only knew your, your deeds. She only saw the actions of the behavior but the person who marries you, they learn your ways. And your ways are different than your deeds. Because in order to know somebody's ways, you have to have intense and deep personal fellowship with them. See, my children know me not only as Pastor David. My children know me as Dad. My children know me as the real person, the guy who's laying down on the couch. The, the guy who, you know, is outside um, pulling weeds or mowing the lawn or, or whatever it is, the guy who, who treats their mother in a certain way. They know me, and they know my ways. They know how my dad is. That's why you could talk to one of my kids, or you can talk to Marie, and you can ask them, uh, why did David do this? And they can supply an answer for you because they know me, especially my children. I'm telling you, my, my Corinne, my David, my Joseph, my Anna know why their dad does what he, what he does. You know why they know? Because I have lectured them all of their lives because I have explained my ways to them all of their lives. 
because they've seen me do something, and they'll say, why did you do that? And I'll say, I do that because of this, 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 and that. And this is the truth. My son David can tell you what his father would do in any given circumstance. My son Joseph can do that because they ask me questions, and I explain to them, and they have watched me. They know my ways. Some people can only see what you do. Other people know why you do that. Moses knew why God did what God did. He knew his ways. He had fellowship with God. The children of Israel knew the deeds that God did. They knew that the Red Sea had been parted. They knew that manna had been given. They knew that quail had been given. They knew the actions of God. But Moses knew why God did that. I want to know the ways of God, not just the actions of God. I want to have fellowship with God, a relationship with Him, so that I can say, I know why my Father did that. That comes through time, it comes through fellowship, it comes through experience, it comes through prayer, it comes through reading the Word, it comes to saying, God, open my eyes to see wondrous things in your law. Help me to understand your ways. There's a difference between religion and relationship. People can have religion and explain things about God, but you can have a relationship and know why God does those things, you see. And when he's speaking here concerning Moses and the children of Israel, there's a dynamic difference. In Numbers, in chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, God speaking says, Hear my words. If there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly, not in dark sayings. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then are you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? If I want to reveal myself, I can speak through a prophet. Moses is more than a prophet. We have intimate communication. I speak to him face to face. And that's knowing the ways of the Lord. Now, in verse 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious. This is what the Lord had revealed to Moses. It's actually recorded in Exodus 34. Slow to anger, abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Because of these attributes, in other words, you can trust him, and he will deliver you from oppression. For, he says in verse 11, as the heavens are high above the earth... So great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Now, verse 12 is an interesting thing, and as you consider this, just a picture in your mind's eye for a moment, a globe. And if you go in the equator and you start proceeding with your finger, we'll say going north on a globe. You know as well as I that as you proceed north and follow the circle of the globe, you ultimately begin going south. And I find that interesting because what it says here is as far as the east is from the west. If you're on the same globe and you're following the equator to the east, just follow that globe, you will never go to the west. So it's a picture here of God totally separating you from your sin. Totally. It'll never be brought up again. That's the picture that you have here. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Why does he do that? Well, fathers pity their children, and the Lord pities those who fear him. There have been so many times, especially when my children were small, that they did something that was very, very dumb. Shouldn't have done that. But I would look at them, and I would think, but they're just babies. They don't understand. You know, and you have a compassion, a mercy for them. My grandson Josiah is in my office, and I had a, 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 a vase that was uh, given to me by, by uh, um, Pottersfield Ministry, and uh, it was a gift to me. And I came walking in my room after a Sunday morning, and my daughter Corinne's there, and she's with my Josiah, and Corinne says, Dad, you know that, that vase that you were given? I said, yeah. She says, was it important to you? <laughs> when you use the word was, past tense, was it important to you? And I looked at her, and I said, not as important as Josiah, because I knew he must have, and he did, he busted it. He grabbed it and dropped it down. Babies do that. 
you know, and you know what? So what? So what? Because even as a grandfather says, you know what, Josiah, you want to break that too? Break it all. I don't really care as long as I've got you. You have compassion. You have a pity. And that's what the Lord has for you. Keep that in mind, by the way. Some of you didn't have dads who were like that, did you? You know? Some of you, you, you were a little kid and you were putting milk in your cereal and spilled it on, on the table and your dad freaked out because he couldn't afford to get any more milk and he got mad at you for doing that. And he sent you to your room without your breakfast and you were upset and you were hurt because dad was so mad. He didn't pity you. He didn't realize you were just a child. You know, when my kids were little and they spilled the milk, let's clean it up. That's all you have to do. Let's clean it up. No big deal. Because there were times in my life that my dad might have been a little harsher than he should have been. And I think, you know what, I don't want to duplicate that with my kids. And you learn to pity. You learn compassion. Well, if I, being an evil father, try to show compassion, how much more so shall my heavenly father be compassionate to me? And that's what the scripture says. He knows our frame and he remembers that we're dust. We're made from the dirt. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. The wind passes over it. It's gone. Its place and its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to such as keep his covenant, to those who remember his commandments, to do them. And so the Lord is merciful. The Lord is gracious. The Lord does reveal himself to us. And there's no sin that is so great that God cannot forgive. As a matter of fact, God ple is pleased to forgive our sins because he is so gracious and kind towards us. Even though we are transient, even though our days are like grass, uh, we're here for just a moment and we're gone. And the Lord is well aware of that. So God desires, the scripture says here, to show us mercy. Notice verse 17 and 18. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. God desires to give us his mercy and he gives mercy to those who fear him, to those who desire to keep his commandments. In Psalm 119, verses 10 and 11, the psalmist said, With my whole heart I have sought you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. My desire is to, with my whole entire heart, seek you. Now, that sounds like a large order. It is a large order if you think in terms of like 30 years from now and all, you know, and you think, gosh, can I do that? I discovered that if I seek the Lord with my whole heart day at a time, I can do that today. If I do it a day at a time, then tomorrow I'm going to succeed where I might have failed today. All I need to do is have an attitude to pursue him with all of my heart. And I can do that day by day. I can wake up tomorrow and I can pursue him again, even if I fail today. I used to tell my kids this when they were small, if they blew it and they were going to bed and they'd been in trouble that day, I used to tell them, and it's probably every day I told them this, but I would tell them, I would say, you know, um, tomorrow's a new day. We can start over tomorrow. This day's over. You're going to put your head on your pillow tonight. We're going to pray. and You're going to go to sleep. But tomorrow's a new day. And tomorrow, you're going to do better. Because that's how I treat myself, to be honest with you. Because there are times that I've laid my head on my pillow saying, Lord, I just wasn't as faithful today as I should have been. I'm so sorry. I want to be better. And then I remember that his mercy is new every morning. And I thank God that the next morning I wake up, his mercies are renewed in my life. And that's how I live my life, by the way. Every day I wake up basically saying the same kind of thing. Today is the day the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. The Lord's going to take care of me today because his mercy is forever. It endures forever because he loves us. And I just want to obey you. In verse 19, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength to do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you ministers of his who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Because he rules, all creation is called upon to worship him. That's why in Revelation 5.13, we read every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them. Well, John says, I heard saying, blessing and honor, glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. 
Bless the Lord, O my soul. May the Lord grant that we have hearts that learn to rejoice and to be grateful for all that God has done for us. May we not be ungrateful children. May we, may we be those who, who realize that all the benefits that we have came at great cost. They came at the cost of His Son. And He has been so good to us. And He will be good to us tomorrow, the day after, and into eternity. So may we obey His commandments and love Him and serve Him with all of our heart.